In 1923, Adolf Hitler tried to seize power in Germany for the first time. His great role model was Benito Mussolini, who had been successful a year earlier with his march on Rome and thus took power in Italy. Hitler wanted to follow his footsteps and march on Berlin. Well, if you follow the route on the beer hall putsch today, Google Maps says it takes 33 minutes. Not quite the time it would take to march to Berlin. I'll follow the trail and show you what interesting places there are to see along the way these days, whether they have anything to do with the beer hall putsch or not. The beer hall putsch started here. Not in the Hilton, of course, but in the Bürgerbräukeller, which stood here until 1979. The history of the Weimar Republic, the first attempt of a German democracy between the two world wars, is quite complicated, but also fascinating. To make it simple, Bavaria had a far-right government and many far-right groups in 1923. Basically, the right-wing state commissioner General Gustav Karl von K. and the Nazi led by Adolf Hitler were fighting for supremacy in Bavaria. On October 8, 1939, a meeting was held in the Bürgerbräukeller with an audience of 3000 nationalists at which von K. was to give a speech. Hitler tried to take an advantage of the situation by surrounding the hall with 600 Nazis. Hitler, Göring and the former World War General Erich von Ludendorff stormed the event. Hitler managed to calm the room by shooting his revolver once into the ceiling and then proclaimed the National Revolution. Von Kahr and the police chief were asked at gunpoint whether they would join. And when you look down the barrel of a drawn Luger, there's only one correct answer. Yes, of course. Ludendorff then believed Von Kahr and his colleagues and dismissed them. At the same evening, the freedmen prepared to crush the coup. On the morning of November 9, the coup leaders realized that they no longer had many options. So they marched off from the Bürgerbräukeller in the morning to get the population on their side. If you take the path today, you should turn right shortly after the Hilton. There you will find a memory plaque to Georg Elser, a simple carpenter who almost single-handedly eliminated Hitler and the entire leadership of the NSDAP. Hitler and the Nazis celebrated the Beer Hall Putsch in the Bürgerbräukeller every year since the seizure of power. From August 1939, Elder visited the Bürgerbräukeller every evening and secretly hollowed out the pillar next to the lectern. There he planted a bomb with a timer. On November 8, 1939, Hitler gave his speech on the anniversary of the Putsch. However, as the weather was bad in Munich that day, he was unable to take his plane to Berlin and had to take the night train. Hitler gave his speech 30 minutes earlier than planned and left the hall at 9.07. The bomb went off at 9.20. If Hitler had given his speech as usual, he would not have survived the day. Unfortunately, Georg Elser was caught during his escape shortly before the Swiss border and murdered in Dachau concentration camp at the end of the war. He is my favorite resistance fighter and a role model for all those who listen to the conscience. If you continue along the path of the coup, you will pass the Gasteig on the right hand side, the largest cultural center in Europe with space for the Munich Philharmonic Orchestra, the city library, many rooms for cultural events and so on. It was opened in 1984. However, the Gastec is currently undergoing general renovation and will probably not reopen before 2033. Opposite the Gastec, down the hill, you can see the Muffertwerk, somewhat hidden. It was built in 1837 by city architect Karl Muffert as a waterworks and later a power station. The power station was operating until 1973. In the 1980s, it was used as a tennis hall for municipal employees. Since 1992, it has been used as a venue for concerts, theater performances and parties. With its beer garden and café, the Muffertwerk has been a fixture of Munich's nightlife for years. On the other side of the street, to the left, you will find the Museum Lichtspiele, one of Munich's oldest movie theater dating back to 1910. It also holds a Guinness World Record, 
As you can probably tell from the lips, the movie Rocky Horror Picture Show has been shown here every Friday and Saturday without interruption since 1977. But of course there are also other movies to see. Crossing the street again, just next to the Muffatwerk, is the Müllersche Volksbad. It is named after the engineer and philanthropist Karl Müller, who made a fortune in his career. He donated houses to the city of Munich with the order to sell them and to use the proceeds to build a bath for the population. This was completed in 1901. The Müllersche Volksbad is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful baths in the Art Nouveau style in Europe. That is why several films were shot here, including the Italian cult horror film Suspiria by Dario Gento from 1977. Today is nowhere near spooky in the Müllersche Volksbad, instead it's a place where you can either warm up in the sauna on rainy days or simply float at the pool and admire the ornaments. The path continues over the Ludwigsbridge, here you first reach the Museum Island. On the right hand side you will see the Father Rhine Fountain, it was created by the Munich sculptor Adolf von Hildebrandt. But you might wonder why a fountain dedicated to the Rhine is located on the Isar? Because the fountain didn't originally stand in Munich, but in Strasbourg. It had stood here since 1903 on Brogeliplatz, now Place Brogeli. At that time, Alsace-Lorraine was still part of Germany. After the war was lost in 1918, Alsace-Lorraine was returned to France. The fountain was dismantled in 1919 due to anti-German sentiment. In 1929, the city of Munich exchanged the fountain for another work of art with the city of Strasbourg. And that is why the Father Rhine has been standing here on the Isar since 1932. Opposite the fountain is the building complex to which the Museum Island owes its name, the Deutsches Museum. It is one of the largest science museums in the world. The part of the building you can see here is the former Congress Hall. You get the impression that nobody really knows what to do with the building. Sometimes it was used for congresses and concerts, then it housed Germany's first IMAX movie theater. Occasionally it has been empty and today it's the home of the Blitz Club where the night owls go to get lost. On the roof you can still see the eagles that the Nazis put up. The swastikas beneath them were removed in the course of denazification. And speaking of Nazis, in 1923 the beer hall putsch was briefly halted here at the Ludwigsbridge. However, the 30 policemen deployed here were no match to the Nazis. After crossing the Isar you can see the German Patent and Trademark Office on the left. It moved from Berlin to Munich in 1949. Continuing along the pass you come to the Isar Tor. It is Munich's best preserved city gate. If you would like to find out more about the city wall and the city gates, you should watch my video about that. Just behind the Isar Tor on the left is an inconspicuous place, but one of great historical significance. The Sternecker Breu Inn was located here. After the First World War in 1918, Adolf Hitler initially worked as an informer for the German army. His task was to gather information about the many new political parties in Bavaria. In this role, on September 12, 1919, he was to scout out the meeting of the small party DAP, Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, German's Workers' Party, which met here in the Sternerkapoi. There he found like-minded people and joined the party. Less than six months later, at Hitler's instigation, the DAP was renamed NSDAP, 
the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The Sternecker Preis served as the first party headquarter of the NSDAP. It later became a museum for the Nazis. After the war, the building was used for stores. In the future, it will once again become to an inn. The Beer and Oktoberfest Museum is located behind the former Sternecker Breu. It also offers the opportunity to stop for a bite to eat. If you continue along Imtal Street, you will first pass the Heiliggeistkirche on the left. It is one of Munich's oldest churches from the 14th century and belonged to the hospital that once stood outside the city wall. Opposite is the old town hall, which serves as an entrance to the Marienplatz. On the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch on November 9, 1938, Joseph Goebbels gave a diatribe against the Jews here. It was the starting signal for the programs of the so-called Kristallnacht, in which Jewish stores and synagogues were burned down. They were not spontaneous outbursts of popular anger, as the Nazis propagated, but had been planned long in advance. If you want to find out more about the history of the building, I refer you to my video about the city gates. The Nazi march past the new town hall on Marienplatz. It is a neo-Gothic style building from the 19th century. The Glockenspiel is world famous and I have already made a video about it. In the middle of the square is the Marian column, which was erected at the end of the 30 years war, also as a symbol against Protestants. At Marienplatz, the Nazis tried to attract even more onlookers to their side. In the picture you can see one of the worst agitators, Julius Streicher, giving a speech. The march then turned into Wein Street after Marienplatz. After 250 meters, the procession turned right into Peruza Street, which ends at Max Josefsplatz. Straight ahead, across Maximilian Street, you can see the Maximilianeum. This is where the Bavarian Parliament is located today. On the square is the State Opera House and the south facade of the Munich residence, which is modeled on the Palazzo Pitti in Florence. I have already made a video about this too. The coup then continued down Residenzstraße. The Bavarian police were already waiting for them at the junction with Odeonsplatz. The street is particularly narrow here and so 130 police officers were able to confront the approximately 3000 Nazis. Both groups were heavily armed and it's still unclear who fired the first shot. At the end of the shootout, 50 Nazis, 4 policemen and one bystander were dead. Hitler was only spared because his neighbor Max Erwin von Scheubner Richter pulled him down when he was the first to be fatally hit by a bullet. Hitler also survived because his bodyguard Ulrich Graf intercepted 11 bullets with his body. One can only speculate how many millions of deaths the world would have been spared if Hitler had also died here. The trial against the Putschists could also have been a way to stop Hitler. But as already mentioned, the Beerhole Putsch must be understood as a coup which was also a power struggle between right-wing groups. The judiciary was not made of Democrats either. Hitler was only sentenced to five-year imprisonment, of which he only spent nine months in prison. During this time, he wrote Mein Kampf. After seizing power in 1933, the Nazis celebrated a veritable cult around the Beerhole Putsch. Two so-called Temples of Honor were erected on Königsplatz for the fallen Nazis. Since it is so difficult to divide 15 sarcophagi between two temples, the poor, uninvolved bystander Karl Kuhn, who also died in Hitler's coup, was quickly declared a Nazi. I have already made a video about the eventful history of the Königsplatz. On Odeonsplatz, the Nazis erected a shrine to the so-called blood witnesses at the Feldherrnhalle. It was flanked by two SS guards and anyone walking from Residenzstraße to Odeonsplatz had to salute the shrine with the Hitler salute. However, there were also small signs of resistance. If you go back a few meters along the pass, you will find Viscardi Gasse behind the Feldherrnhalle. This also became known as Dajas Alley. All those who were on their way to Odeonsplatz and did not want to give the salute took the detour via Viscardi Gasse. Today, golden paving stones commemorate this small act of resistance.
Today, at least architecturally, the evil spirit of the Nazis has disappeared from Odeonsplatz. It is shaped as King Ludwig I once intended. In the middle is the Feldherrnhalle, which is based on the Loggia dei Lanzi in Florence. To the east you can find the courtyard garden of the residence in the French Renaissance style. To the west, in yellow, the Tiatine church in high Baroque style. In 1649, the wife of Elector Ferdinand Maria of Bavaria, Henriette Adelaide of Savoy, made a vow that she would build the most beautiful and most valuable church if God gave her a hereditary prince. After the wish was fulfilled, the Tiatine church was consecrated as the monastery church of the Tiatine order in 1675. I hope you enjoyed this walk through Munich and that you understand the attention. Munich has a lot of history to offer and there are bright and dark spots. The beer hall putsch was a pathetic attempt to overthrow the government, but unfortunately it didn't discourage the activists. I hope you'll be back for the next video. If you are interested in a guided tour of Munich, here is my email address. Until then, Philip out.